good. Thank you for making it easy for me with a good preparation. Yeah, my, my pleasure. It. Awesome. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're going to let people uh, funnel on in as we get started. People are streaming in. This is great. I'm super excited to talk to Christoph today. Shout us out where you're from, too. Let us know. Country, city. We get usually people all over the world joining these. All right, I'm going to get Toronto. There we go. Vienna, Austria, San Francisco, Bangalore, Belgrade, Serbia. Nice. I'm in, I'm in Chicago. Sao Paulo, Brazil, Baltimore, very cool. Budapest, I love Budapest. Oh, we have somebody from Kiev here. Yeah, wow. Oh, well, I'm, I think this is Pavlo from Kiev. Um, I'm sure you have more important things to, to worry about right now. So really appreciate joining. Singapore, Los Angeles. Christoph, are you in Berlin right now? No, well, I'm, I'm in the southwest of Germany, close to okay. Stuttgart. Um, our office is in Berlin, though, but we've okay. always been somewhat distributed. Very cool. All right, we're going to get started here as uh, people continue to funnel on in. Uh, this is being recorded, so we will uh, send out the, uh, uh, the recording to everyone, usually within 24 hours or 48 hours of the write-up. And uh, again, if you have any questions, you can leave them in chat. Today, we're all talking about benchmarking SaaS metrics uh, with Christoph. Uh, so really want uh, today, just first of all, Christoph, thanks for, for joining us. Uh, Christoph is a partner at um, Point9. Uh, we just kind of heard in, in based in Germany. Uh, he's the founder of, uh, his words, not mine, failed startups, but also some successful ones. Uh, he's also the first Czech uh, angel investor in, in Zendesk. Uh, he's a prolific tweeter, if, you, if you've seen him on Twitter. Uh, and you might have come across uh, his very viral uh, SaaS napkin math, uh, which we will certainly cover today and, and kind of one of the core uh, themes that you'll, you'll take out of this. Uh, and for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mike Cruz. I'm the, the founder of Visible. Um, and uh, Christoph, thanks for, for joining us. Anything I, I missed there before we jump in? No, nope. sounds great. Thanks so much awesome. for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for, for coming. Uh, so real quick before we get started, started, uh, Belle on our team, uh, she's standing by so she can help answer any questions. She'll share some resources real time with everyone uh, and get those uh, questions submitted through chat if you have them. And again, this is being recorded. So uh, we will send this out 24 to 48 hours after. Um, first, let's just talk about point nine. Um, uh, you know, your your stage, your geography, from what I understand, you guys have uh, four funds that you uh, have under management now. I think the most recent being uh, 100 million euros with some pretty epic companies here. You got Loom and Algoria, Whereby, 15.5, Zendesk. Um, what, what stage are you guys focused at? You know, uh, what kind of business model, geography? Kind of give us your name, rank, and, and serial number. Sure. Yeah, so we've been around with 0.9 for about... 10 years um, and really in since then, since the very early days, we've been very focused on the seed stage, um, which maybe you could argue and maybe we'll discuss that later has become a big phase over the years. Um, and we um, like our, our fund sizes has, um, has our fund size has like increased over the years in, in line with just how the ecosystem has developed, but we really uh, kept focusing on early stage. So we haven't become like a series A or series B investor. We're, we've really been sticking to making seed investments. So from that point of view, uh, not so much has changed for us from the very first fund to, to the current one. Um, we're probably 95% B2B SaaS and B2B marketplaces um, and among like in this B2B bucket, probably a bit more SaaS than marketplaces, but depends on really the, the fund or, or the year. Um, in terms of geography, we've always taken a very geo-agnostic approach. So we've never thought of ourselves as a, as a German fund or 
let alone a Berlin fund uh, where we would only invest in companies in our backyard. Um, some of the very first investments that we did back in like 2009, 2010 were in places like Canada, um, in even one company in New Zealand and in various European countries. So um, we've always been open to finding great companies um, pretty much anywhere. Um, but uh, that being said, probably 60, 70% of our investments are usually from Europe. And actually an increasing percentage in the last few years, and can deb debate why that is. Um, I think one factor is that the European ecosystem has, has really uh, developed um, yeah. in, in a very exciting way. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um... So yeah, if you if you if you haven't heard of Point Nine, I can't believe that wouldn't be true. But if you haven't, check them out. Uh, a pretty amazing uh, team and, and portfolio, and, and doing great work as you heard, like all across the the world from from the get go. Uh, I want to kick things off with uh, this pretty famous slide you put together about the five ways to build a hundred million dollar SaaS business, and it's kind of a sliding scale. As you see, we got number of customers here on the the y axis and revenue on the per, per account on the, the X. Um, and you got, you know, I'm going to get a lot of small customers all the way to like big whales. Uh, but, but my first question to you, Christoph, here is uh, why $100 million? But why should that be the number founders care about when they're thinking about building and, and scaling uh, their, their SaaS company? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, $100 million in ARR is, or arguably at least used to be, kind of like the type of company, uh, the, the kind of like the scale which venture capital investors are typically looking for when they make an investment. So um, this is definitely not relevant for everybody, right? There are lots and lots of um, like somewhat slower growing, smaller, but highly profitable SaaS companies out there. And um, uh, some of the things that I speak about or write about as a VC may not be relevant for, for companies who choose a different path. But the moment you raise venture capital and even more so from a bigger fund than, than 0.9, you have to understand that the investor invests in you because they hope that this is going to be one of the few investments that will get very, very big and might return the entire fund or maybe do it multiple times over. And to, to do that, to create an, a company which ultimately is worth a billion or several billions as a, just as a rule of thumb, 100 million in ARR is a, a, is a good target or at least a good milestone. It obviously doesn't have to stop there. Um, and I guess that in combination with the fact that it's just a simple round number uh, was like the, the trigger to, to use that for the simple framework. Yeah. Do you think that, uh, you know, that's, that's maybe one of the, the questions you always hear from, from a, uh, your first kind of VC is like, how does this become a hundred million dollar business? That might've been a question 10, 15 years ago, you know, more frequently you're hearing billion dollar, right? How does this get to a billion? Are you seeing a shift where the, the litmus or stress test for the market is, not a hundred million in, in revenue anymore, but a billion? Or do you think like the, the hundred million is still a great lens to say like this company is, is venture backable or not? Yeah, I definitely think that investors and especially later stage investors um, want to see the potential to go way above a hundred million, like hundreds of millions or maybe billions mm -hmm. in, in, in revenue. But at least around the time when we invest, this is so far away that it's hard to project anything. And I, um, so I think it probably also wouldn't be really be actionable for, for founders. And even a hundred million is maybe five or 10 years away, right? From yeah. uh, when, when you're looking, when you're looking at a, at a seed round or, or a series A round. So, I think this is less about market sizing. This is, I think, a different topic and maybe something, maybe another type of, of, of lens to use. Um, the five ways to $100 million framework, I think, is more relevant uh, 
in the way it makes you think about customer acquisition and how mm -hmm. can I build a scalable sales and marketing machine where I balance my CACs with my LTV, even though you might still be an order or two of orders of magnitude away from that $100 million goal, it might already be relevant much earlier. Yeah. Uh, at, at point nine, are you guys looking at the different animals we have here? And are you focused on uh, a certain, you know, uh, a type of the, the deer or whales, or are you pretty agnostic and will back uh, any of the different type of, of opportunities you see here? Yeah. So we're interested in a very wide range of, of animals and have uh, seen very successful companies and maybe not with regard to all, but most of them. I'm not sure in this like mouse category where you have only a hundred dollars of average revenue per account per year. Um, this is this is almost more consumer -y or like prosumer mm -hmm. than uh, than real business. Um, but the moment you talk about these rabbits with a thousand dollars, just in terms of the order of magnitude per customer per year, that's um, not an untypical pricing for an, an SMB. And um, we have invested in, in, in several companies that have uh, have a price in, in that range and have been able to acquire lots on lots like thousands or tens of thousands or more of customers. Um, I think our journey with SaaS um, started mostly on this rabbit and deer part um, mm -hmm. with, with companies like Zendesk uh, that focused a lot on the user experience and product and consumerization and then went up market eventually, but not really from day one. Um, mm -hmm. But over time, we've also worked with companies that are enterprise and go after elephants, or maybe in some cases, even whales at a, at a much earlier point in their journey. So there is, it's really not that one of these strategies is right and the other is wrong. It really depends on the market some money is going after and and the team if, if they have the right skills or if they can develop the right the right skill the right skills for for that for, for that model have you seen the distribution of this change over the last five to ten years like more people starting uh maybe with our higher revenue sizes or, or lower revenue sizes or has it been pretty consistent uh over the the last call it decade yeah i i would say one change that we've seen over, over the years is that more and more company focus more on product and product-led growth. And even though they might eventually end up with an elephant or whale type ACV, they still have a, a free trial. Um, and so my, they might cover a, a larger range of, of ACVs. And also if you look at companies outside of our portfolio, like like Slack and, and Dropbox, maybe being famous examples, or 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 Zoom, um, they they all have a free version or a free trial, um, and doesn't prevent them from still generating a very significant part of their revenue from from much bigger customers. So, I think this very traditional enterprise only um, sales and marketing motion has. Um, maybe become somewhat less uh, frequent. Um, mm -hmm. I still do think there are markets where this makes the most sense just because of the, the structure of the market where if, in, if it's a market where um, really there aren't um, re a lot of relevant SMBs or there is no clear upgrade uh, path. So that still, that still exists. Um, I think another thing that we've seen is that an increasing number of companies show that they were able to scale inside sales for a lower price point than was than was than what was previously assumed to be possible. Um, mm. I think uh, I think the the general conventional wisdom, and I would say especially if you talk to people from the U.S., um, because everything is tends to be more expensive in in the U.S. 
than in at least many other countries. I think um, the conventional wisdom was that it's like very hard to build an inside sales team if you don't have, let's say, at least ten thousand dollars in of of our part. Like meaning it's 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 a dear. And there are there is a number of companies that manage to do that at a significantly lower ARPA. Um, I think in some cases um, it's because the product is a very simple, easy sell, like very strong immediate ROI. In other cases, it's because it's an international business. And in, uh, if it's in Latin America, for example, or maybe even in some parts of Europe, like the, the average um, salary of a salesperson might be just 10 to 20 percent of what you're used to paying them in in the US or especially in places like New York or the Bay Area and uh, that can have a like a transformative impact on on your CAX and, and therefore on like uh, the type of growth machine that you can build. Yeah it, well, interesting what about I'm gonna throw a curveball at you I don't think I put this in our in our brief but uh, I think traditionally you see as companies grow and try to hit that $100 million milestone, they go up market and, uh, and, and try to you know, go from a, a deer to an elephant and increase ACV. Uh, they need to go up market, higher contract sizes. What are, what are common uh, things you see founders or companies do well when they tra transition uh, that you've seen over the years? And, and maybe what are some uh, common mistakes that you see founders make as they try to move uh, more, more on market. Yeah, um, I guess it depends a bit. Well, it depends on lots of <laughs> on lots of factors, right? It's a bit, uh, and I think it's hard to uh, we generalize any any of these things. Um, like, for example, like some companies um, might really move completely from an SMB focus to an enterprise focus because the SMB segment just turned out not to be attractive enough. And in some of these cases, um, I think some companies who have done it really well have almost abandoned the SMB segment. And I mean, while still like still serving them, still uh, taking care of these customers. But um, I think the point is that in order to go successfully up market, um, let's say from a from an, a rabbit focus to an elephant focus, you kind of have to change the entire company, right? It has an impact on um, everything from product management to how you do sales and marketing, customer support, customer success, and you might need additional people who you haven't had before at all, like for like more experienced salespeople or professional services, and. Um, it can be really hard to do to do both at the same time. So doing both really well, like um, with a company like like Zendesk or, or Slack that I've mentioned before, they usually do this when they are already at a certain scale and can just afford to do more things in, in parallel because they have the, the team and the structures for that. Um, if, however, you are a much smaller company and um, you go out of one segment into another segment because the, the original segment isn't, isn't that attractive, then you might face some real tough uh, trade-off decisions. Um, I, I think if there is any general advice from this, I, I would just say that if someone tries to change their segment in a, in a very significant way, um, I would just talk to a lot of other founders or CEOs mm -hmm. or people who've, who have done this before and who are serving that segment to, to learn about all the things that you may have never seen because there is, you, just, you, haven't, you haven't come across these types of um, requirements yet. Yeah. Um, it, it is a very big um, organizational shift that, that comes with that. Excellent. Uh, that, that's super great. Um, yeah, talk to talk to your peers. We're going to move on to maybe one of uh, Christoph's more famous things that has been produced over the years, uh, and that is the uh, SaaS uh, napkin math for for funding. And if you're a founder or even an investor, I think this is a, an amazing resource. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, I think Christoph's done it each year, where uh, you have 
the kind of different rounds of funding. You have the round size, the valuation, and the targeted ARR, and then some other level of you know qualitative. Here's where we think the company's at, uh, and and it's, it's it's certainly changed through throughout the years. You know, we see we have pre seed here of a valuation of, of two and a half to, to four and a half million dollars, um, an ARR from from zero to six hundred k. So you know you can you guys can kind of see this here on the screen. I guess the first off, for my own curiosity, Christoph, how did this? Because it's a physical napkin that was the original you know, like incarnation of this. How did how did this come to be? Um, let me. That's a really good question. Um, I, I I don't actually recall like uh, how I or, or like one of my colleagues came up with the idea to put this on a like literal back of a napkin. Um, I think the trigger for this was that it's just a question that comes up all all the time, right? With founders at all stages, since as as a founder you typically have to raise every one or two years and and uh, it, despite the fact that you read a lot and see a lot of data i think um, founders are always really keen to understand where they are relative to others and if they are in the right shape to and to go after a, a certain type of financing so i think it was clear to us that they are um, was a lot of interest in in this, and and we were starting to get more data points because of our growing portfolio. And so I guess we yeah we just thought yeah. let's let's make it simple and uh, try to put it onto a a napkin. Yeah, how, how have these how have these changed over the years? Right, I think if you were to rewind maybe five ten years ago, the 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 benchmark for seed might have been a million dollars in ARR. Yeah. And, and now we're seeing like zero to 600K. How have you seen these, you know, change over the years? And, and, and I guess maybe more of a loaded question, but why? Why have we seen this, this change or, or shift? Yeah. So the data that we're looking at here is from early 2021. So that's about a year ago. And if we compare this with the data that we collected like some years before that, or if we think about data from let's say five to 10 years where 10 years ago where the napkin didn't exist yet, but I still recall some of the valuations that we saw yeah. there. It's been an ever increasing, uh, like it's, it's, it's been only going up, right? Like valuations and round sizes until last, the last quarter of last year, Q4 2021. Um, so the the the, tw the end of 2021 version of this would look quite different, actually. Um, where I think we we've seen um, Series A Series A rounds being done at 100, 150 million uh, pre money, and and Series Bs like sometimes hundreds of millions. So um, uh, to be seen how this continues. I think the I think it's. It might be that the end of last year was a a peak or at least a, a local maximum, and I think um, in uh, in this quarter now and maybe in the next couple of weeks or um, months, um, we'll probably not see the same types of valuations that we've seen um, towards the end of twenty twenty one. But um, but we'll see, right? Um, on your question, like what has driven all of this um i think i would say it's i mean it's a combination of factors so let me maybe mention just two of them um, I think one is that really this amazing success of the cloud and SaaS companies uh, and even more broadly just online and digital companies over the last 10 to 15 years or so look if you look at where the uh, state of the industry was 10 years ago and compared to today it's just so much bigger and also so much more bigger than I think anybody ever thought so um, I think really um, I think every investor is aware of of SaaS now which wasn't the case when when we started investing in SaaS and some of the public SaaS companies um, have turned out to be some of the most amazing and most profitable businesses like 
from that you can that you can imagine, right? So the, there has just been really proof that uh, software is like really um, eating the world. To to quote um, Mark Andreessen there, and that SaaS is just an incredibly good uh, business model, and so um, th that led to an enormous amount of companies being created and also an, an enormous amount um, of funds being being raised so just the there is so much more interest in the in the sector now um and then the the other factor is just how much money there is in the system generally right like with um, a, a very long period of very low or, or even zero interest rates and um and, and really not that many interesting ways for like big big capital allocators to in, invest money and so um there's just so much more venture capital available today than some years ago and you have funds that were previously investing only in public companies or in private equity which also increasingly invested in earlier stage venture capital deals like like Tiger, like uh, famously, uh, yeah. which invested in huge amounts of companies last year, and, and all of this uh, led to larger round sizes um, at higher valuations, and uh, also at like more money invested at earlier stages than than previously was was thought possible. Yeah, what? Uh, so we see in this huge lift in in round sizes and valuations as you mentioned towards the end of 2021 uh now in 2022 we've seen this correction in the public markets um right now and in, in kind of the hot topic at least on on twitter is all about what does this mean for you know startups today um and so i guess my question to you is you guys primarily focus on on earlier stages so, so seed companies you know should i as a founder of a seed company, or or maybe I'm I'm investing at the seed stage, should I pay attention to what's happening in the public markets and things like burn rate and and all of these other kind of macro factors that I, I can't really control, or should yeah. I just stay focused about building my business? Like, how much should I kind of pay attention to what's happening at the you know called the late stage public markets, and how does that affect me as a, a early stage founder? Yeah, I I think I wouldn't. Uh, spend too much time thinking about that right because it's as you said it's not something you can change uh, or control for much anyway I, I think you can keep it in mind where if and when you're raising uh, around and as if you think about uh, runway and what is a good valuation so um i think at that moment in time uh, you are somewhat connected to um, to the bigger financial world. Um, but what, when that fundraising is done and you hopefully have runway for at least 12 18, to 18 months or maybe more, um, then I think you should focus on building your, your business and you really shouldn't, shouldn't worry about, um, about um, what's going on on the financial markets. Yeah. I mean, if, if if a company is in a difficult situation and runway is um, getting tight and and they have to um, they have to raise maybe at a time where uh, it's it's difficult because of this macro environment, then you're kind of you're forced to deal with yeah. you know, these things. Um, um, so I I guess that just means in general it's good to uh, be like uh, reasonable when you. Think about your burn rate and then make sure I have enough runway so that there is still like a chance to to course correct if something happens or if it's something takes longer. Yeah. Uh great question came in from, from Jim here, and I think it's relevant to the slide. So we'll 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 do it now into the QA. Uh three of these uh tiles here talk about product market fit and clear product market fit. Uh is this uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you read stories about companies that have $3 million in ARR and don't have a uh, product market fit. Is there a framework in which you guys at point nine uh, think about product market fit? Is there uh, a metric or is it something like when you see it, you, you see it? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to define, right? And like some companies 
might claim they have product market fit with a couple of customers and maybe 100K of ARR. And then, as you said, you have others that have maybe millions in ARR and they are less sure about their product market fit. And I think that's just because it's um, because there is no generally um, accepted definition of, of that. We, we don't have it either. I think we, we think about product market fit not on a binary not as a binary switch, but more on a gradual scale where we try to assess the degree of product market fit, um, not, in a, not in a scientific uh, way. Um, what we're looking for um, when we assess companies and, and think about do they already have product market fit or when we work with a very early stage company and, and we invest in them when they clearly don't have product market fit and we try to work with them towards product market fit, then we look at a number of um, different indicators, um, which ones depends quite a bit on the type of the company and also really the type of animal they are going after. Like if it's an enterprise company going after elephants and, and whale, then whales, then it's probably not very quantitative in the, in the early days because you will probably not have dozens of uh, of, of prospects. So then it's really more about trying to figure out if you have a couple of companies that use the product in the way that you think they should be using it. And if um, they get value from it, and if they would be disappointed if they could no longer use it. Um, if it's a, a higher velocity, lower uh, pricing, a company going after one of the smaller animals, then you might see it in the data in things like conversion rates, retention, um, usage frequency, and and things like that. Um, but it's it's hard to quantify like what percentage of conversion rate or retention um, like like make for a good product market fit because it just depends on on so many different factors. Like yeah. you might have very poor retention metrics, not because your product sucks, but because you attract the wrong type of user or maybe get a lot of very unqualified traffic for, for all kinds of reasons. So um, I, I think I wouldn't be able to uh, like uh, really from the distance tell you how product market fit yeah. looks like. But I think if you dig in and look into some of these numbers or talk to users, you think you start to develop a, a sense for, for that degree of, of product market fit. But um, I think it, it always comes with a lot of question marks and uncertainties because even if you think you have product market fit, you might have product market fit only with respect to a very small number of customers, like in a very small niche. And so if you kind of, try to cross that niche to like like the, an adjacent niche you might you might have a setback again so um it's also not something that once you think you have it you can take it for granted that you will always have it yeah uh, last question and we'll, we'll move on to the, the next slide uh how data driven do you like to see founders uh, uh, approach their business, or how, how, yeah, how data driven do you have to see founders? And I guess, how does that change maybe like, across these stages? Like, do you expect uh, founders coming in at seed to really know some of the metrics you just mentioned, or does that evolve over time? Uh, yeah, I would love to just get your, your thoughts on, on how data driven uh, you think founders should be as they progress through, through these different stages. Yeah. So I think once you once you have a product in the hands of customers, I think you should be pretty data driven. And um, the metrics that you will probably be looking at will be vastly different from what comes later, right? It might not be revenues at all. It, it might not be pipeline related. It might be entirely usage related in the, in the early days. Um, and uh, there might be a phase where you're just so early that the numbers don't tell you anything and uh, it's just about iterating on the product and trying to get to that product market fit by talking to uh, talking to users and and, uh, and and building the right product but um i i think it's good to think about this 
sooner rather than than later. Um, and even if it's even if it might be clear to a small founding team what needs to be done um, because they just like have all the context and and and, and knowledge. Um, for the team, I think it's also important to instill that culture, like how are decisions being made and how are decisions being evaluated and, and re-evaluated. And that needs to be based on something which different people can agree on, right? And, and some kind of evidence or, or data. So I, um, I think it's important to, um, to start this sooner rather than later. And then as you progress, you will just keep adding more and more metrics and eventually every department has the metric has their metrics to focus on and every team member ideally has certain metrics that they are responsible for awesome uh we'll, we'll move on to more uh of our um maybe, maybe some more questions related to to how you think about data within within point nine um i'd be curious to hear you know are you guys think do you guys benchmark your own portfolio companies? Meaning, are you looking across the portfolio, uh, maybe bucketing people based on on segment? You know, what type of business model and and um, you know average revenue per per year per account? But how are you guys thinking about uh, you know benchmarking your portfolio companies? And what does that exercise get you? Do you put that in the back back into the hands of founders? Are you using that for future uh, investment decision making? Uh, I'd just be curious, like, it sounds like you guys obviously are very data driven. How do you guys think about benchmarking your, your companies internally? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, even though we have a pretty large portfolio, um, like, because we've been, been investing in SaaS companies for, for many years, um, nevertheless, um, I'm to some extent, and then you, you might have some really good answers from your company there to look to to really find meaningful benchmarks because so many things are just dependent on company specific factors and even if we might have 80 SaaS companies that we've invested in over the last 10 years if we look at companies at a similar stage with a similar go to market motion it might be only only a handful and and so and um, what works for one company might not that be that relevant for another because there are just different factors and, and explanations. Um, that being said, we, we do track some KPIs across the entire portfolio. Um, and that uh, uh, that helps, like if we discuss some of these things with a founder, it, it might help them just get a broad sense for like, how are we doing? How are we doing mm -hmm. in comparison to others? and um, I think it also helps us, <clears throat> sorry, um, I think it also helps us understand how later stage investors will look at things, like what are what are their expectations, which then helps us um, support our founders in like going uh, out for the right type of financing to the right investor at the right time. So I think I think it helps um, with that. Um, and then, um, and then there are maybe some some much more specific things where we don't really collect all of the data across 80 or 100 companies, but where we can connect one the founder from one SaaS company with another one, with a peer mm -hmm. at a company that was maybe in the same shoes two or three years ago and can tell that founder like very specifically like what what they were paying an AE in that market and what the quota was. So I think it's um, there is a lot of learnings from one company to another, um, but this is, I would say it's a bit more like really specific case by case. You drill in very deeply and try to understand what you can learn from somebody else who maybe a, a has more favorable metrics in a certain area. Um, I think this is probably more useful, at least on, on our side, than looking at a huge body of benchmarking mm -hmm. data. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I want to keep moving because we got some questions coming in. I want to make sure we get to, we got a couple of slides left. 
Uh, this is from the, the same post talking about uh, the, the Goldilocks zone of, of metrics. Uh, and it's, it's talking about how you know, the higher your LTV, the, the higher the, your, your, your CAC or uh, you know, different conversion rates, but you still get the same yield. Um, so I would def definitely recommend everybody to go check this out. Uh, our, our team kind of came up with, with kind of three questions we thought it'd be great to get your take on here, uh, Christoph, which is kind of the first is, when should uh, founders become you know, intentional with measuring LTV to CAC? Um, you know, looking back at the, the two slides ago when we had the, the different stages, is this something I should concern myself early on? Uh, maybe once I have a, a set of customers, like when do you think it's, it's the right time to start being intentional about when you're tracking LTV to, to CAC? Yeah, so I, I think you should, be, uh, you should be thinking about this from a very early stage, but it, it might mean, it, it, it doesn't mean that you actually will have the data early on. So what I mean is that um, it might take many years until you have a really good understanding uh, or a, a way to really calculate LTV and, and CACs because you just need um, a number of customers and you need to observe churn rate and expansion for some time until, um, until you're able to, to estimate um, LTV and, and similarly on the CAC side, it just takes time to figure out what custom acquisition costs at a certain scale look like. Because early on, if you, as a founder, you do the, the sales yourself, it, it's very hard to extrapolate from that in a, in a really quantifiable way. Um, nevertheless, I, I do think it's useful if you, if this is, if this concept is just really, really, you're really conscious of that concept because um, it's totally fine in the early days to overinvest in customer acquisition and customer care and make every customer successful and, and an evangelist of your product. Um, but you just need to be aware that in order to scale this, you'll have to change things a lot. And if you, are in a situation where you employ like elephant type customer acquisition efforts to acquire a customer who only pays you $100 um, um, a month, then if you have to think about what that means, right? And either you're confident that over, the, over time that'll change because you um, slowly but surely increase your pricing or you decrease uh, the, the cost to acquire customers slowly but surely, but if, if that doesn't seem to be likely, then maybe you need to do something more radical. And maybe, um, maybe you find out that you can actually sell the product to a bigger customer who pays you 20 times the price, and maybe that's just 50% um, more effort. So I, I think important to keep it in mind conceptually while being aware that you won't really have a close grip on the numbers anytime soon. Yeah. What, what role should investors play in, in, in or do you play uh, with point nine on coaching companies with, I'm, I'm kind of bucketing this uh, all to the kind of unit economics. Like how, how, how much are you paying attention, uh, helping companies think about it, especially as it relates to the next round of, of financing? Should you be more hands-on, hands-off? Like what role do you, do you guys tend to, to, to play? Yeah, um, it really depends on the stage. Um, at the seed stage, um, we typically don't have the all these all these metrics. So, uh, at the seed stage, my response would be similar to the previous question. So, yeah, you should understand it, but you shouldn't expect to really have the numbers already. Um, that obviously changes over time, um, and at a series A, a series B, and, and so on level, um, unit economics become measurable and eventually critical. Um, nevertheless, if you are growing really fast and you're well-funded and going after a large opportunity, you might consciously decide to accept pretty poor um, unit economics uh, if, if you want to grab a, a large market share. So I... 
I, I think this is something which investors and, and founders or shareholders of the board need to discuss and, and align on, right? Like, um, what, uh, like, like, how much are we willing to pay for an additional customer um, in order to get a, maybe some extra growth, um, knowing that this will come at a, at a much higher cost than what it, uh, what it took to acquire like the first customer. So um, I think those are some of the discussions that need to, need to take place. Awesome. Uh, last slide here, and then we'll we'll wrap with with uh, Q and A. Uh, so we're we're looking at this uh, VC compatibility compatibility calculator by point nine uh, that that you guys have, and, and it takes like five minutes and, and five T's. Um, what what um, is this the best way for uh, uh, founders to get in touch with you guys? Uh, how do you guys look at this data? Um, I'd be curious to hear what, what this has kind of yielded for, for you guys on uh, decision-making frameworks and, and some of the things that you guys are doing on the, on the deal flow side. Yeah. So I think this is, I would say this is more like a, maybe a, a fun a quiz that uh, maybe helps founders think through what 0.9 or other VCs look for. We, we don't have a checklist uh, internally. We don't run uh, companies through that through that form or, or calculator, um, we as we probably have I don't know, call it like a mental checklist or like the things that we that we will always want to want to understand in terms of like is this a big opportunity um, is there some tech that might make it defensible um, but the reality is that at the seed stage a lot of it is, is just unknown right and um, market size is typically not what we or anybody else thinks it is early on um, one reason is that well we're looking at a 10 plus year time horizon so it's really really hard to predict and then um, second like market size is usually what the founders make of it right uh, it's, it's not static like yeah. good teams manage to go into adjacent markets and expand market size so we don't expect any uh, super clear answers on most of these questions at the time when we invest but we we know that as our companies raise more money later on like they need better and better answers on that because the investors who come after us at the series a series b series c stage and so on they um they just need more solid answers on these so this is part of the journey to uh, to develop uh, better and better answers on all of these questions yeah awesome um we're going to switch over to q a we'll have a couple minutes here um so if you have any last questions let us know uh, let's start with the uh, kind of some of the audience questions. Will there be a new napkin for 2022? Um, yes, the, glad you asked. Uh, we it's actually way overdue, and and the uh, we've honestly been struggling to produce a new napkin in the last six months or so because things have been changing so so rapidly. Um, yeah. But we'll. We're planning to, co to, to collect data um, uh, over the next couple of uh, weeks and uh, in a few months and planning to then really release a, a new one uh, in, in the next couple of months. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Rohan uh, wrote in to us asking advice on uh, how startups should approach conversations with uh, private equity versus Venture is there is there a difference in that conversation? Should you be thinking about private equity versus venture? Do you have any uh, opinions or, or takes there? Yeah. So at our stage, at the seed stage, it's not that relevant. Relevant, I would say. I think it's it's very rare. I can't really remember cases where at the seed stage founders would um, take money from uh, private equity investors. Um, uh, simply because they're looking for a different type of company, a different risk profile, like um, like usually like lower risk um, and, and maybe or probably also somewhat less less upside. So at the 
at the seed stage, um, I, I think it's, it's usually not really relevant. Um, and then at, at later stages, we, we have seen more and more investors who traditionally invest in, in private equity come in at, um, at a stage where, where it's, uh, you could call it, uh, I guess the, the, it's blurring between venture capital and, and, and yeah. growth equity. I, I don't know if that is clearly defined. Um, I, um, I think you, you as a founder just need to make sure that you are aligned with the expectation of that investor and you should try to make sure that they understand the stage you're in. Um, like if, if it's an investor who typically invests at like public companies or pre-IPO companies and you're considering letting them in your, to your series A, um, it, it might cause problems because that investor just might not be used to the roughness that you have at this stage. And they might panic if, uh, if you miss your targets two quarters after the other. Obviously that doesn't have to be like this, but I, I would generally um, just spend time with any potential investor and, and make sure that they really are the right ones um, for your company and, and for your stage. Yeah, great advice. Uh, this is a great question. Uh, Austin wrote in, what are your thoughts on companies with strong ARR, uh, but they white label their tech? Maybe they're using no code tools or, or white labeling somewhere else. Is that, would you guys consider something like that? Um, yeah, what are, what are your thoughts on, on strong traction, but they don't own the, the tech, they're, they're white labeling it? Mm, I, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure if we really have encountered exactly that situation. I, I think it's great if you can use something simple like no code um, or like some really simple tools to, to validate an idea or to build an, an MVP. Um, so I think it's, it can be a great tool to like get the confidence what you want to build before you spend a lot of time and money on it. Um, but it's it's a it's a prototype, right? It's uh, if you want to build a SaaS product, you will probably not build it based on on Airtable um, as much as I love as much as I love Airtable. Yeah. So if we were to if we if we considered investing in a company um, like this, then we would we would be open to it. We would just ask ourselves: Do we think that this approach makes sense? Do we think that the founders will be able to build a real product. Um, so um, it's, I, but yeah, I would say it's the, it's more relevant for like prototyping than for building a real product. Yeah, awesome. Uh, last question and then we'll, we'll wrap. Um, Sanford wrote in at the seed stage, how often uh, are your best founders reporting metrics? Um, you know, whether it's using a tool like Visible, Google Docs, email, uh, like how often are you seeing that uh, happen? Uh, and any tips on what you like to see personally uh, as, as an investor? Do you, do you get them from even potential portfolio companies as well? And, and what do you like to see in those, in those updates? Yeah. yeah, I think monthly reporting is pretty typical and, and we're fine with that. And most companies do that. Um, obviously, most companies look at their metrics much more frequently, like some metrics probably on a weekly basis some on a daily basis. Um, in some cases we have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have um, access to some uh, dashboards so might occasionally um, look at metrics at a, at a, at a, at a more frequently. Um, I, I, I usually, usually think that monthly is the, is the, is the right cadence um, um, or if uh, we usually have like a monthly check in with uh, the, the founders from our portfolio. So it's also aligned with that, but um, this is also, it's really only one part of our yeah. relationship with founders. So there, um, while we might have these recurring or, or scheduled check in once, once a month, we're probably on in a WhatsApp conversation with them all the time and might talk about specific issues or specific things that might come up in a, 
in a metric, but this is outside of like the more formal um, like reporting. Yeah, awesome. Uh, well, Christoph, thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, this has been great. Uh, thanks for all of the content you you produce. Uh, I think it's super helpful for for founders and investors alike. So uh, thanks for joining us, everyone um, all over the world. Thanks for joining us today too and giving us a slice of your time. We'll send this out and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much, Mike, for inviting me and thanks um, everybody for for joining the, the session today. Yeah. Awesome. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.